And welcome to Community Kitchen. Absolutely magnificent day outside. I think this sort of uh, time of year is really a favourite, especially as you get older. Get away from that summer heat and you just love this autumn time. We've got a great uh, show organised this morning. We're going to be talking to uh, a woman who's actually called the Queen of Whole Foods. She's just about to publish her fourth book. She's from WA. Fantastic. So that's going to be very exciting because uh, here's someone who's dedicated to uh, what we talk about, real foods. And uh, publishing four books is uh, quite an achievement. And thinking of books, it's a little bit of a cookbook day today, one of my loves, I must say. But I had the pleasure of finding this fantastic shop in uh, James Street at Fortitude Valley, and it's called Scrumptious Reads. Need I say more? It's about cookbooks. And uh, if you love cookbooks, you're definitely going to enjoy there. So we're going to talk to Julie, the owner, and uh, find out what is it, what, what makes people love these books. I mean, really, you have one book, and you can probably deal with that for recipes, but for for the uh, few of us who love them, we seem to have a 100 different varieties and, and uh, love scanning and, and learn about what is... What is a cookbook? What makes us want to do this? Anzac Day is coming up. I will share an Anzac Bicky recipe with you. I'm sure you've got one. You've got some little book. And, and I'm sitting here with the um, uh, CWA cookbook because when you go back to those sort of things, it's great to have the old classics there. Still going to follow up on... Um, whether or not we're happy about the CWA competitions accepting the um, packet cakes, let me just say this, New South Wales isn't going to, but Queensland has, and uh, I guiltily made uh, some uh, macarons this week, uh, on the weekend, um, out of one of the MasterChef guys who just released a, a packet mix, and uh, Zumo, he has four different patissiers in Sydney. I thought I'd give it a go, pretty yummy. And they worked, but of course you can do that or you can just get your book out and have a go. Um, I was amazed to hear this morning coming in that uh, Admona, which of course is one of the amazing old fruit companies of Australia, it's now Admona SPC, uh, which is apparently owned by Coca-Cola. Um, I didn't realise that. But uh, talking to one of the growers there, And it's incredible to think that our population apparently today or tonight is supposed to hit 23 million. But this farmer is going to have to or is going to remove part of his orchard because of the imports that are coming in that his fruit is not required in the quantity that he has been uh, growing over the years. That is incredible, isn't it, to think that the imports of fruit have outweighed our farmers of the nation and this is something that we do have a little bit of a nag about on this show buy your local get into your farms respect that uh, we have our own country's produce and buy as much as you can from australia and this is just one little thing and i felt very saddened it's going to cost him thirty thousand dollars to doze all the trees because the pears and the apples aren't required anymore for him then to actually replant with a tree that is going to produce something that we're requiring is going to cost him $40,000. So we've got almost $100,000 there. He has 10 people in, in full-time employment that pick. And that is one little farm I'm talking about. This isn't the whole of, of the suppliers for Admona SBC. This is just one guy. And um, because of the fact that we're importing from overseas, this man is going to lose um, so much from his farm. But it doesn't just stop there, does it? Because what will happen is all those farms are removing. The staff will then have to be put off. He doesn't need those 10 guys to, to pick the fruit. And then, of course, it means that those 10 guys aren't going to be needing a house in that town. And then they're not going to be needing the fruit and vegetables and the, the groceries and normal services and their children will they'll have to move because there's no employment and it's just this real role so once again I can only say and that really we have to consider that Australian produce has to be preserved and even looking in the um, country life this week they're on to a um, 
on to talking about the fact that we really have to have to respect our growers. We have to respect our cattlemen because um, there's so often times that the, that it's very expensive, that the uh, floods and the droughts are affecting them, and we're looking at the global food challenge because we're going to have some problems down the track if we keep going the way we are. And uh, so that's just my little little whinge I guess this morning I do say that we really have to start looking at about at, at our farmers we have to look at our supplies we have to look at what we're taking off the shelves and uh, our mate Dick Smith of course he uh, has been such an advocate for this and I think that um, that just take that extra time and a lot of people say oh well if we have to buy um, our real milk it's going to cost a dollar more to put that could container of milk into our refrigerator and as I often say drop the soft drinks out of the shopping and maybe buy some milk that's coming from a farm because another five years time we're going to be crying because we've got no dairy farmers so you can see the effect it has and um, it's a terrible thing especially when you think our population is to a size wouldn't you imagine that the the little farmer that's going to be dozing his trees would actually be planting more trees to actually take up the slack for the extra population. It's not happening, guys. We're importing, we're importing, we're importing when we have such a beautiful country and talking um, about all those things. You think of the effects of different farmers over the world and a gentleman was saying this morning in the area of Flanders where there's so many um, bombs still left in the, in the ground that these farmers are still digging up and hitting bombs and still having cyanide in the ground and, and mustard gas and, and uh, residues. We are a, such a fortunate country that we don't have to work through that sort of thing daily. So I think it's something we need to respect and something that we need to really push. And I thought uh, Anzac coming up, let's really think about Australia and what uh, a fantastic place it is. We're going to go to a song now. I've had my little gripe this morning and we'll come back with our first guest. And welcome back. I have my first guest online this morning, Jude Bluro. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? I'm very well. It's uh, ten past eight in Western Australia. It Mm. is, Annette, and I've got my cup of tea here with me. Oh, perfect. Now, Jude, I was looking through. I mean, you've done quite a bit, but one of the things that cropped up when I was uh, Googling you and having a look, you're known as the Queen of Whole Foods. I know. Let me tell you, I mean, it, that is rather funny a little bit, but my daughter keeps me very grounded. She just rolled her eyes at me. <laughs> <laughs> Children have a way of doing that. They do. They you, do. You've had quite a journey, and I, I'm just sort of finding out how it all started with you. In 1980, you went to America and you found what we used to always call macrobiotics, which is sort of a word that's not used as much as to nowadays, is it? It, it is, and it's, it, it's kind of actually not actually what I first discovered. I I was a fashion designer um, in the 80s in Perth. I went to the US just a little bit later, but in the early 80s, um, whole America's cup thing, but I'd been in the fashion industry for some time. And I still love fashion design. But I was studying nutrition part-time because that's always been a massive interest and I was so disillusioned with it. And I actually went to the US because I'd always wanted to go. And I, but like I was only there like about five minutes and I met my husband and I came across a book by Anne-Marie Colvin called Food and Healing. And Anne-Marie remains a very large mentor for me today. And when I read that book, it had only just been published, it's like, oh my God, this is speaking my language. Mm -hmm. And I came back to Perth and kind of dismantled my life here and went back to the US to learn. And really the only thing that, that you could learn at that time if you wanted to work in this kind of area was macrobiotics. Okay. And I generally like to say to people, people that have been in the industry as long as me, so probably nearly 25 years now, Holly Davis on the East Coast has been in it far longer than me. Really where you started was macrobiotics because there was nothing else happening. That was kind of, it's our raw, it, it was the raw food of its day. 
It's interesting <laughs> now, isn't it? Because you know, as as generations get more affluent, they think that you know, like, I, even now with my children and looking back at my parents, every every generation we've tried to make children's lives better. We've tried to make our living yes. environment, and yes. then all of a sudden, this fast food thing hit, and it yes. just ripped away food and I, I it, the real food and I think it's a word that's coming up a lot now is real food because we've we've missed this little gap somewhere that took it from food that our grandparents and my my mother used to produce and then all of a sudden now in this in this generation there's so much food that is not real food anymore look that's, a, that's absolutely true my private personal theory about that because I suspect we're probably similar ages uh, you and I but and I think that I certainly know for myself that I've had to I've had the opportunity to live through massive change in my life particularly in regards to women my private and personal theory which I'd love to do a thesis on at some point is that later in Australia but earlier in the US so it started in the US in about the 50s mm -hmm. probably the late 40s 50s later in Australia but I would really love to know which came first was it the industrialization of our life not just food that allowed women to move out of the home and thus when you had the person who anchored the home and passed on wisdoms and cooked and held the house together etc was it that industrial movement that allowed her because she could buy bits and pieces now to have time to move out of the home and follow more of a career path or my which i think is partly it but mm -hmm. i also think that the women's liberation movement left a gap that the industrialization of commodities and food filled um, and and i think what we're seeing now in our younger generations, particularly from women uh, or children in from their 40s, pretty mm -hmm. much over 40s, you're not seeing it, but pretty much anybody that's under 43 or 44, what you're seeing in, in large numbers is that mother, or particularly the mother, that mother moved out of the home. Um, I'm not saying that's a good or bad thing, mm -hmm. but what I'm saying is that as they began to move out of the home and onto a career path, um, that the thing that gave and the thing that was dropped was food and the handing down of our food culture, which is our collected wisdoms about food. For example, you can't eat that brownie for breakfast before you go and do an exam. That's not a proper breakfast. If you're going to go and play or go to school, you have to have a proper breakfast that um, piece of toast is not proper breakfast. That's food culture and food wisdom. And as we've seen this dismantling of, of traditional cultures, particularly in the role of women moving out and not manning the home, um, you're seeing this falling apart of food culture and food wisdoms and, and in industry, like it will in anywhere, has mm. moved in. It's interesting, I had a woman stay at my home just recently from the country town where I was born and she was saying that in 1964 she got married. Yep. She had to leave her job because married women were not allowed yes, to be employed. Exactly right. So that Absolutely. was 1964 and it was quite yep. interesting because yep. all of a sudden you had these rules and, and whilst a lot of people can be you know, listening and going, this is ridiculous and I'm just going to say this, in doing that, in, in changing that now, and circumstances have changed, we want more, but we've lost a lot too. Oh, look, and it, I'm, I, I, I understand exactly what you're saying in regards to that. I know some listeners get upset about this. Um, and I've had this, it's not an argument, it's a discussion, but having had the opportunity to live through this time, I... I am utterly convinced that that rules, the rules have changed. Now, I'm not saying it's for everybody to be at home, and in some cultures, it's the man that, that mans the home, that, that anchors the, house, the home. In some cultures, it's a maid or whatever that anchors the home. But you can't, it, you just cannot have it all. I'm sorry, I just, I've, I've tried to have it all. It's not possible. Something always gives, 
and what's giving in our culture at the moment is food and the raising of children. They're the two things that are giving in culture at the moment. And invariably, one of the things that I'm privileged to see a lot is I'm a large percentage of my food coaching um, business. Really, most of them are women that are in their late 40s that that kind of have all of a sudden stopped and go, oh my God, what am I doing? Mm. It, it's like, a kind, not that I've been duped, but I think that the women's liberation movement, while it's brought many wonderful changes, has also brought some very tragic changes, um, particularly in the format of, it has seduced women to believing that achieving a career and achieving financial success is all that matters and ultimately it's really it's not and um, you can't do any of that if you are not nourished and that's the fundamental of my work if you want to be the amazing person that human bodies are and human soul and spirit are you you need to be you need to be nourished you, and you need to be nourished on a physical level so you need fuel and you need a lot more fuel than people think and you need to be loved as well you know you need to be happy you need to be not stressed out of your brain and and that is pretty much the t the nub and the fundamental of the work that i do is teach i'm kind of passing on i guess in a sense i guess you could say what i'm trying to do is bring those kind of food wisdom back into culture and warm fuzzy feelings now something i did read about you is that um you know, one thing, and I must say I agree with you, is food is only as good as our soil and that we really... Oh, yes, absolutely. And we must have consideration for the farmer because it's, it's, let me say, it's a dying art. And I just had a little bit of whinge before about it because it's one of those things that we really do push on our community kitchen here is the fact that we must be buying our, our fresh produce, our seasonal produce. Support your farmer because imagine 10 years down the track and we're going to lose a lot of this most amazing produce that we have in Australia. Well, most likely probably not even 10 years down the track. I mean, you're seeing it, uh, you're in Queensland, I'm in Western Australia. We're seeing it in both those states. Queensland is slightly more tragic than Western Australia at the moment with its obsession with coal seam mining on some of the best food growing, the best soil. We don't have a lot of good soil in Australia and it is, defies a civilised society that the little good soil that they have they're using they're destroying for for short-term gain um i find that really concerning but yes western price and many many people from far back understood all cultures understood the value of soil now, our soil is in a lot of trouble in australia i'm a big supporter of organic and biodynamic farming systems but fully understanding that what that's going to be called in the future is going to be changing. You might be buying from a farmer that's not certified but is growing in ethical manner and looking after the soil uh, in a sustainable way. The way we do this and the way we call this is going to change. But what we do need to be doing um, is we need to be more prepared to pay the true cost of producing food because if we don't, every time we go to a supermarket and buy that cheaper product there is going to be farmers that dig their peach trees into the ground their apple trees into the ground the orange trees into the ground and walk off the land and that is happening at a massive rate this week last week the week before and every week into the future farmers are moving off the land because they can't compete and, and it is it's tragic. tragedy. I know. It's ter terrible. Now, let me take you to another subject which I feel very passionate about and something yes. that we've been really concentrating here on our community kitchen for the last month, and we're talking about children. I can't believe the amount of problems we're having with food with children. We've got diabetes going out of the wall. We've got food allergies. We've got fussy eaters. We've got problems happening all the time. And, um, and what what, what, what's happening, do you think? What's going on? Well, I can believe that it's happening. I'm certainly not surprised. Um, you, I think there are lots of things happening and they're all converging at this point. Um, some of those factors include 
uh, overuse of antibiotics, um, the whole issue of gut ecology where good bacteria in the gut and, and they're critical for human health are uh, being destroyed I guess you could say with um, our obsession with antibiotics uh, not just in the way we've taken them but I would also say in the way that we're using them in, in the whole area of genetic uh, engineering um, and in the animal food mm. supply in mm. our foods in our, in our cows and all our animals so I think number one it's that number two I think it's with our obsession with cleanliness all our antibacterial wipes children are not being exposed to dirt um, as an interesting factor about three years ago I went to oh, about, about four years ago now I went into a daycare centre and I was shocked and you've got uh, this is coming from my first career as an early childhood so kindergarten teacher mm -hmm. so I've got a pretty intimate understanding of young children and I was shocked to see that children were being fed with gloves so any time a child is touched in any daycare centre pretty much in Australia blow their nose change their nappies eat their food or feed the, the child their food all the food is handled they're being handled with a new pair of plastic gloves now what that is saying to a child is that dirt mm. painting getting paint on you is bad dirt is bad food is is not to be touched so there's all that kind of area of dirt um, bugs all that kind of thing is bad and then secondly what we're seeing the food that children are actually eating there's really confused ideas about what healthy food is today um, really healthy food pretty much is old-fashioned food healthy food is not necessarily gluten-free um, at all but you look at traditional first foods for children they were even in Australia up till probably about 40 years ago they were brain they were liver they were egg yolk now first foods today for children is usually a grain of some description um, children are being asked to eat earlier than their digestive systems are ready to eat and I see many an allergy posing um, as that um, and off they go to the doctor for tests and antibiotics etc when they're not eating in inverted commas a, a porridge at nine or ten months that's just ludicrous mm. um, a lot of the food that the children are eating is not in a format that that child understands a child's digestive system is geared for fat and protein it's not geared for carbohydrate we are asking them to eat foods in wrong software programs that that food is not matching their body um, and most of what children are eating is refined I um, noticed one or it point. doesn't have any life force I noticed one point you made there was children are not adults and They're I think not. And that is a, not. a very good point because even their eating patterns change. Yeah. I notice if I've got my grandsons, um, yeah. they have breakfast and then around half past eight, nine o'clock, they're sort of looking for something. So yeah, they, they tend not. to forage a little bit throughout the day. Well, they've got little tummies. Mm. Um, and, but, but when they're foraging and when they're hungry, what they need to be eating is is good nutrient dense food what they do not need to be eating and what most children are eating is processed carbohydrate chips or crackers or bits of bread mm -hmm. that's what most children a large percentage of children in Australia are eating and that is not a nourishing food it's good to remember that with children not are they doing everything an adult body is doing like running running their body keeping it warm protecting it against bugs um, all the hundreds of, of cellular processes that happen every day every single minute pretty much of every day what that child is doing is going out to a building site and hauling concrete to build they're building bone they're building muscle they're building organs they're building brain and they need a large amount of nutrient dense food it's a bit scary when you look at the uh, go into the shelves and I remember talking to a mother, a woman just recently who worked in one of the schools and she was saying that one little boy in his lunchbox had 16 packages of food. This I've mentioned this about 10 times. That's it's not still, unusual. It's still, that, that's not unusual. It's crazy. It's, <laughs> that, that's common. That, that is the norm. It's very easy 
for you or me to think that it's not the norm because people listen to our program or come to or read my books or hear what I have to say generally because they've got a little bit of an interest mm. but I'm reminded when I get out into the world but that is a very very small fraction of the population in Australia you know when you see what is generally going on even in some inverted commas healthy households mm. it's it is no surprise that our children are in the state that they are now. It's just none. It's, it's, you cannot... It, it's like, I don't know who said Einstein or something, you can't, you can't solve a problem, I think he said, with the same mind that created that problem. And it's like, you just can't do all these things, not wrong, but just bizarrely and, and in a refined manner and in just a... a, a and manner with their there's no sense and not expect for them to be this 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 all these things converging at some point and that's what we're seeing mm. you know children are eating most children in Australia have an exceptionally high calorie intake it's nutrient deficient um, it's high calorie intake from refined grains refined sugars refined high fructose juices Probably the healthiest food they eat is, is fruit because everybody thinks that's healthy. There are very few children having good fats, mm. good meats, um, good meals. Not snacks, but good meals. Good meals. Let's just jump to one thing about your books. Yeah. Cakes. Yeah. I love the fact that you embrace cakes. I'm a cake maker because we live on a farm. I do morning teas oh. and we do things oh. like that. And cakes are something I left today and we, we had the guy coming over to help us muster. He said, what about morning tea? <laughs> As yeah. if it was just something that, oh, no, we're going to miss out on morning tea. Uh, you know, these are grown men and they absolutely love a cake. I never feel guilty about it because I use butter. I have my own chooks. I use good flours. I use good ingredients. And I was brought up in a family where you enjoyed a cake. There's nothing wrong with a cake. I if think one of the... Sorry, Annette. Go ahead, go on. Um, I am, I'm quite passionate about the role of sweetness in, in a whole life. And I think that the way we view healthy food now is very fractionalised. I, I really dislike the word healthy, but I think how we view wholesome or nourishing or healthy food is just as fractionalised as, as how we view generic food at the moment. Uh, one of the things that cops at most is sugar or is sweetness. Now, I'm the first person that's going to say, look, if you take sugar, which has got many minerals and vitamins and all sorts of great things like polyphenols, or amazing things in it, if you take all that stuff off it and separate it and then sell it as a supplement, a health supplement called molasses, and take it down just to the sucrose and ingest nothing but sucrose. You know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to be able to say, it's not going to work in your body all that well. Mm. And it's important to understand that that's what people are mostly consuming. People eat nothing but sugar in the form of carbohydrate or fructose, which is not necessarily sucrose, but in the form of white flour, white sugar, uh, high fructose corn syrups, they eat nothing but that for breakfast, lunch and dinner and morning teas in, on, on the whole. Now, I think there, is an, there are many lovely whole un- and semi-refined sweeteners that are much more body compatible and you can make delicious cakes and desserts and sweet treats with these. And I, I think that is, I think sweetness is a really important aspect of life. It's looking at a nutrient called joy and deliciousness, and I think that is a very overlooked nutrient. I think our issues with health today revolve not so much around sugar. I actually do not have a problem at all with a cake made with white sugar every now and then. God knows I grew up with them, my mm. mum generation and the generation before that, but do you know what was going on at that time? People ate real food for breakfast, lunch and dinner. That's right. They have nutrient-dense food every single day at every meal. They did not exist on snacks all day. They had good, solid meals with wholesome snacks in between. They were more physical. They were happier. 
they weren't stressed out of their brain. They weren't taking their children to three or four after school activities every day or every week. They weren't getting up at six o'clock and dropping them off at a daycare centre at seven uh, and picking them up at six. They themselves weren't working 10 to 12 hours a day. They or 14 or 15 hours a day. They weren't trying to do everything. They had support. They had days where they were slower. They sat down and enjoyed meals with family. They had people to talk to and share their burdens. And, and I think that, that that aspect of how we structure our life is absolutely critical to the role of health. And I'm a huge believer that dessert uh, a few times during the week, doesn't have to be every day, um, and, and cake um, on the weekend or during the week uh, for afternoon tea or something is, I think it is a wholesome and nourishing and healthful thing. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I wish we had more time. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I, I'm so sorry. I can just completely ramble. Hey. I'm, just, I'm pretty passionate about this subject. <laughs> well, I think our listeners know that. And I always say to people, if you can't afford to buy the books, go to the library. But, I mean, having one of the books... Absolutely. You're Absolutely. going to... Uh, you're releasing use your libraries. Yeah, use your libraries. But you're about to release a new book. Um, yes. so whole people, food baking. Whole food baking. So there you go, listeners. And uh, thank you for taking the time Such to talk. Such a pleasure, Annette. And, a uh, pleasure. Thank you for having me. And you're coming to Queensland soon, so our listeners can look out for that. I am. I um, am. You better put on some good weather for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Jude, for talking this pleasure, morning. Pleasure, Annette. Thank you for having me. Bye, Bye now. And uh, there's a woman with passion. We'll go to our... Um, Sponsors And welcome back to Community Kitchen. Uh, we have our next guest online. She has a wonderful little shop in uh, Fortitude Valley. Good morning, Julie. How are you? Hi. Good morning, Nanette. Thank you. Thank I'm you. Fine. I uh, had the pleasure, as I mentioned to you yesterday, I had the pleasure of coming into your shop. It was like uh, going into a little dream house for me, for someone who loves cookbooks. And I was so interested to find out why someone would have a book, just a, a shop just totally dedicated to cookbooks. What made you open a shop of this type? Um, it was a bit of an extension of my own personal library. I love reading um, everything about food, and I really like the history um, of different foods and also the science of cooking and just of general knowledge about um, the culinary um, topic. I think it's amazing, isn't it, when you look at it? And, and yesterday I was Googling and having a look at cookbook history, and it just goes back and back and back to, you know, second century BC. There was a Greek gourmet who, who, you know, talked about all the different foods, but it not just talked about cooking, it gives you a great history, it gives you an idea what was happening in that period, which is very interesting. Yeah, um, a lot of the history books on food, you'll find that it's just not about food, like you say, but about the time of the when the book was um, written. And I think a lot of people don't realize food has made a lot of changes um, geographically and financially for many areas. But so things like salt and cod um, have really changed the the way you know finance finance and geography is for where they come from mm -hmm. if that makes sense yes it does and just looking at some of the things I mean when you look at the fact that there's one particular book that was written by a master chef for the imperial court of Kublai Khan the important things to know about eating and drinking I mean that was written back in the 12th century um, and to think of all the beautiful Chinese um, information they would have had there would have just been incredible. Yeah, it would have been. I, whenever I read those type of books, I just think, wow, it's um, amazing had you been in that time. And just to think about all the different um, happenings and just what they thought of that is connected with food and it's also connected with health as well and just the whole gamut of... Um, topics that they cover is just not food and I think it's quite relevant until today as well because a lot of those things are coming back in when you read some of the modern books on um, you know the 
the health and also the politics of food. I noticed that the State Library has this handwritten recipe book that was written in 1860 from Tulgai Homestead, which is in the Allara district. But it didn't just talk about food. It talked about what trees they were planting, what sheep they had bought to increase their herd. And it was a, a, quite a social interaction also. Um, and to think that we had, I think it's, it's called Grass Dukes and Shepherd Kings, and uh, to, it was a fe- written by a female too, which is something I wanted to bring up because a lot of books back then were written by men. I actually haven't read that book. I have to go find it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have, I think you have to make a, an appointment at the State Library to go and yeah. have a look at that. But it was written by a woman. Her her and husband owned the um, uh, owned Talgai and uh, Talga Homestead and, and she kept this chronicle I guess you would call it in more terms of, of cookbook but it had a lot of different things like recipes how to cook uh, kangaroo because a lot of the times if people didn't have food they would cook um, you know kangaroo her oh, name was Phyllis Sarah Clark just for your interest oh, and thank you. yeah so uh, that's quite interesting now I, I wanted to ask you I've just been talking to a lady from Western Australia Jude Bleureau and she's just about to release her fourth cookbook a very passionate woman and you can see that each cookbook has its little story and you can see why she has her recipes and and um, and things contained in her book have you found that there are people who come in with specific uh, areas that they look at have they have cookbooks changed or, or what, what are you finding is, is most appealing in your shop for people um, I have a Quite a few different areas that's been quite popular. Um, the movement on raw foods and um, veganism has been all the books that we have on those topics always sell out. Okay. And then on the other side of it is um, books on meat, mm. so um, how to kill the beast, prepare the beast, and um, just how to make use of the whole animal which I find quite interesting because, you know, they're quite polar opposites, the vegans and the raw food yeah. and the meat. Yeah, so those two have been quite popular and also um, in our store we are going to be having quite a lot of the food journals from around the world mm. and they have been um, selling quite well because I think we are the only ones in Brisbane that have that variety um, of different food journals. I must say I've bought one of your, the food journals there. I bought one about meat. <laughs> because oh, the meat paper one? <laughs> yes. What did you think? I think it's fantastic. Well, we grow beef on our farm, and, and I was so interested in finding that because... Um, you know, I was interested, and I have a son who's a butcher, so the whole lot sort of fell into place for me. And uh, and I was very interested to see how different countries, as you say, use the whole beef. They're sort of going from the nose to tail, and there's a whole a whole little um, what would you say, a little culture of people who are trying to get away from just the expensive cuts. Because whilst we're all um, looking at finding different things, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to economic mix too doesn't it yes that's very true um a lot of a lot of the customers are saying you know um it's fine to to um eat all these different parts of it but they need to know where it comes from and a lot of them have set up their own little groups where they are doing um something like expeditions or camping trips where they all um come together as a group Mm. but it's a big social event as well but also, I guess, economics would come into that because, you know, they all chip in into, um, into cooking and preparing the food. That's interesting, isn't it, that people are starting to respect. I mean, there has been this little bit of a thought going through for a while that people respect where their food comes right. from. And in you saying that, there's groups of people that are getting together and enjoying that. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely is. And then having the store, it's been really good for me because I'm meeting all the different people and... Um, just being aware of what's out there and um, cause you, you usually wouldn't come across um, these groups of you know individuals who are interested in going back to basics you could say mm. That's fantastic. I recall having a guest on my show one day and they, they do a lot of medieval cooking 
and they get together and they actually dress up and they cook the medieval food and they might cater for 50, 60 people at a time. And oh, that would be something interesting. Yeah, and, and, and that's what I was saying to the gentleman. I mean, how far do you go back? And he said, well, we actually, we really like to take it from how the same style as the medieval cooking. We try to use the bowls that were made of the wood and we try to do as much as we possibly can in cooking in that style. So it sort of fits in with what you're saying about people want really following the trend through. Mm. You actually know, have a book called The Medieval Kitchen as well, so I wonder if they have that book. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? So you're you're always sourcing different ty- types of books all the time. Yeah, I try to find as many um, of the older type of books as well. Um, it's getting harder for me to find the out of print and more, um, you know, more of the vintage books, mm. but that's that's the area that I would like to expand for for the bookstore just to have that um, variety and point of difference as well and I guess I have to ask you this no doubt you like cooking yes I do (laughs) (laughs) I think that's one of those things isn't it and I was saying earlier that you know whilst you might have a book that's um, you know I mean I I also have a cookbook collection and uh, I I just love it and yet sometimes I look at and I go why would I buy another book and why would I how could I possibly need another book when you've got so many but as you say it's such a beautiful way of reading and you get a little bit of history at the same time and it's very pleasurable it is, it is. Um, I think there's uh, nothing better than picking up a, a good book and reading it, and especially when it's a topic like food. You know, I think food just brings quite a lot of joy to people, <laughs> and when you look at really beautifully presented um, cookbooks, it, I don't know, it's just a certain certain feel that you have when you read through it, and especially when there's a backstory to it as well. Mm. You don't have to t- convince me, Julie. <laughs> I'm totally there on that one. Well, I um, now just let us know where where do uh, can people get online and have a look at your your business? You have a website. Um, at the moment, we're working on our online shop. Yes. And if you go to scrumptiousreads.com, it's just a landing page at the moment. But you can follow us through all our social media, through Facebook and Twitter, and we have a blog as well. And in all those um, profiles, we have what we are doing because we do a lot of events, um, food and drink events, Mm -hmm. with um, different professionals in the field. So as an example, we have um, Matt Wilkinson, Christine Mansfield, and Jude Blaru are coming this month, uh, sorry, in May, Mm -hmm. um, coming to the store. So um, if people would like to know what we're doing, they can follow us through that way. Or if they are looking for certain type of book, they can just give me a call and I actually can source it and send it to them. Now, Matt Wilkinson, I have his cookbook and I will say that I cooked his mashed potato exactly to his uh, method and his ingredients and uh, I had been married for 38 years and I didn't tell my husband that I'd copied this particular thing and I mean it sounds simple mashed potato and yeah. when I served it he said it was the best mashed potato is ever tasted in his life Oh, wow. <laughs> so you have to come to the event and tell Matt that. <laughs> so, I mean, when you think about that and you've followed something through as simple as a mashed potato, yeah. uh, it, it was it was scrumptious, for uh, want of a better word. <laughs> Thank you, Julie, for taking the time to talk to me this morning. And best of luck with your shop. And no doubt I'll come and, and uh, say hello to you the next time I pop in there. Okay, thank you, Annette. Thank you for having me on your show. My pleasure. And uh, we've been talking to Julie from Scrumptious Reads. And seriously, have a look at it because um, if you love cookbooks like I do, fantastic. Uh, We're going to go to our sponsors. We're running behind today. We're almost finished for the day. But for those who don't have a cookbook, and uh, remember you can go to the library. You don't have to buy them. But uh, I just want to give you a recipe for um, Anzacs. It's Anzac Day on on, uh, Thursday. And it is something that we have to remember. These would have been something that a lot of guys would have been sent boxes from their parents and their mums and their grandmas and uh, I'm sure that this has probably got a little bit more sh- butter or whatever because those sort of things were a little bit more expensive those days. Very easy. cup of flour, cup of rolled oats, a cup of sugar and a cup of coconut. Mix all your dry ingredients 
melt the butter in the syrup, which is half a cup of butter, which is 125 grams, and two teaspoons of golden syrup, and get three tablespoons of hot water, and uh, one teaspoon of soda, and so you pour the boiling water into the soda, and you stir that into the butter, and pour into your dry mix. Form into flat biscuits in your hand, patting together, place on your um, papered slide, and uh, bake at 170 degrees till light brown. Now this is from the Bundaberg um, branch of the CWA cookbook. It's one of those little tiny ones I leave in my bag, my uh, radio bag, because there's always something you can find in here. And of course, um, I often say to people, if you ever want to give us a buzz here, you might want to share something, you want to find out something about food, we can do that. We've got to ring 54951015. Um, we love food on our community kitchen and we talk about it every week. So if you want to share something, don't forget we're here and you can ring, leave a message for me and I'll definitely get back to you if you've got something interesting that you would like to uh, come on the radio and talk to us about. We've had, uh, I think, great guests this morning, Jude Bluro, and she's uh, known as the Queen of Whole Foods. Four books, about to release her uh, new book in May, uh, Whole Food Baking. Um, it's not bad to have a cake, guys. It's good to bake one, and I think it's a wonderful thing. And, of course, we had Julie from Scrumptious Reads. Um, if you love cookbooks, worthwhile finding that out. Uh, thanks for joining me this morning. We're going to go out with a song, and I will... Talk to you next week.